number 10 on our Wii U G list is the hybrid fighting game from Bandai Namco, Pokémon Tournament. The game was rumored about for a long time, ever since a leaked photo from the concept of the game hit the internet, followed up by an arcade release of the game, and then rumored rosters full of many Pokémon who naturally fit into a fighting game made the rounds. And then we met with this roster of 16 Pokémon. 16 Pokémon, which included Chandelure for some reason. However, another 30 Pokémon were also available as support Pokémon. Despite a lacking roster, however, this game was actually a positive addition into the fighting game genre. A fun, seemingly casual, Tekken-esque fighting game. Until a phase shift is triggered. This turns the game into a Naruto-esque strategic arena battler mid-fight. Combos become harder to hit and support Pokemon become less accurate to use as well. The online was also very stable and as always has the best and worst of the fighting game community represented. The story mode was a simple tournament Pokemon gym style story. There's character customization we wish actual Pokemon games would learn from and the Pokemon had some amazing moves. All in all, we are happy to have played this game even if the Japanese game did get a few more characters added than we got. This game is well deserving of its place at number 10. Number 9 also happens to be the ninth game in one of Nintendo's most successful franchises, The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker HD. Our one and only HD remake on this list, most would say it is possibly the greatest remastered game to ever be made. The game in its original form was actually panned by most critics and supposed Zelda fans when it debuted at Space World in 2001. Fast forward, though, to Nintendo Direct in 2013, which announced an HD remake, and you could not have dreamed of a more opposite reaction. The game came out later that year, with upgraded gameplay mechanics, complete graphics update, and a more streamlined story which introduced early on the Swift Cell, as well as changed the Triforce Hunt in the latter part of the game to be a more enjoyable experience. Remember in the GameCube version, which required the Game Boy Advance to use the Tingle Tuner? Ooh. Not anymore. Now send a tingle bottle out into the world using Miiverse. Oh, poor Miiverse. Press F to pay respects. And have a message or picture wash up in a bottle onto someone else's beach. Amazing, right? Do you know what can be tingle bottled? Selfies. Yes, lounge selfies. Mid-battle selfies. Gold ghost tingle selfies. Tingle creeps me out. I don't like saying this about tingle. Anyways... This game not only has those amazing additions to help it out, the original game had plenty of things going for it that made this a must-play in the catalog of Zelda, Nintendo, or just all games in general. This game had the most unique soundtrack, which was very Celtic-inspired and sounded marvelous. Also, the obviously unique cel-shaded art style that helped inspire numerous successful franchises. Let's not forget the story and setting. Hyrule was flooded many generations ago to stop Ganon when the hero never showed up to stop him. Now the world has evolved into a very different place, but the Triforce and those three chosen by it still continue its journey. We could go on and on, but this isn't a review. Wind Waker is ninth on the list, but could easily make a case for first. Number eight might be a little controversial. However, it was the strongest and most shocking launch title for the Wii U, and also it was the only Wii U game that truly understood what the Wii U could do and should do. Zombie U from Ubisoft launched with the Wii U back in November 2012 as a hardcore zombie survival game, which focused on interactions with the gamepad while still showing your surroundings and character in third-person view on the television, all to heighten the sense of tension. Take it back 18 months from the game's launch and it was a frantic shooter about alien robots from outer space attacking you. Obviously, that idea was scrapped for the complete opposite style of game. And what we got was a gloomy, chilling, and impressive survival-focused game that had a story which centered around a zombie apocalypse, because again, it was 2012, that had been predicted by a prepper thanks to the works of John Dee. The outbreak is being battled by a doctor to the royal family, and a nice woman named Sandra is also trying to help you escape. The main hook of this game wasn't the story, which wasn't bad, but rather the consequence of death that existed in the original title way back in 1986. When you die, you respawn as another survivor who must get back to your previous point of progression, with the help of some shortcuts, and kill your former self who is now a zombie so that you can retrieve your backpack of supplies. If that doesn't make you think twice about zombie killing strategy, then I don't know what will. This may possibly be the most Miyamoto game on the Wii U because it married hardware and software perfectly. We were very lucky to have experienced the software as it was meant to be played, 
on the Wii U. Lucky number seven on our list belongs to a game that series creator Hideki Kamiya often states would never have gotten made had it not been for Nintendo. Yep, the seventh game on our list is none other than Platinum Games' own Bayonetta 2. There are the standard quirky supporting characters like Robin, the bartender at the Gates of Hell bar who provides weapons, and Enzo, the creepy, greedy undertaker who is much of the comic relief in the game, and Jean, Bayonetta's BFF, who must be rescued from the Inferno. As much as the characters add to this game's unique style, the entire franchise is truly crafted around the main character, the Umbra Witch, Bayonetta. Her strong female empowerment is truly showcased with a well-crafted combination of allurement and deadliness. The girl has freaking guns in the heels of her shoes to support the dual pistols she never goes without. The fluid combat in this game using said pistols, witch time, and carefully placed demon summons is perhaps the best example for fast paced combat in any action game. The game encourages multiple playthroughs of its levels with harsh grading at the end of each level, letting you know just how inept you truly are. On the subject of gameplay, this game actually has a gamepad mode which allows you to use the stylus and gamepad to control Bayonetta as she is fighting. This allows any non-gamer to get a crack at a very rewarding combat system. This is one of the only games ever to have a feature like this in such a hardcore game. Between great gameplay, a cool story, and a beautiful setting which takes place in locations inspired by the divine comedy, this game truly has everything we look for in an amazing game. Also packaged with Bayonetta 1 for Wii U, this game truly belongs in any Wii U collection. With many action adventure Game of the Year awards and overall Game of the Year awards to its name, Bayonetta 2 is well deserving to be on our Wii eulogy, and we hope this isn't the last we see of the Umbra Witch. Sixth on our list will soon be playable on PS4, Xbox One, PC, and the new Nintendo Switch, but its one and only true home for the last four years has been on the Wii U. The game, Lego City Undercover. The character, Chase McCain. The mission, Take down the infamous Rex Fury. This game looks like Grand Theft Auto was made by Traveler's Tales because it basically is, except you're a cop, and the people you hit turn into Lego pieces, not bloody messes. The combat introduced counters into the Lego mechanics. It also had a massive open world that blended New York City, San Francisco, and London all together. Instead of being a Lego game that would have been a specific franchise spoof, they really got to tackle a wide variety of pop culture including Titanic, Dirty Harry, The Matrix, Die Hard, Shawshank Redemption, Starsky and Hutch, and plenty of Nintendo's own franchises. Despite the low number of Wii U units, this game actually sold pretty well. It spawned a prequel on 3DS that set up the backstory for Chase, Rex, and many other characters in the game which sold well too. The reviews came in and were very good for the title. A lot of people being happy with the gamepad being used as an easy access map, gyroscopic camera, and a speaker for your police radio. The use of disguises to create replayability and puzzle solving within levels was a nice workaround for not having many characters at your disposal, which is the typical LEGO strategy. The game was one of the only strong titles to come out between launch and the following fall. Luckily, it was one of the best Wii U games ever made. Number 5 on our list launched on the Wii U and was also the only new Zelda-ish title that launched on the Wii U first. Hyrule Warriors from Koei Tecmo is a shameless copycat of their Dynasty Warriors franchise with Zelda themes and characters, but we freaking love it. And it's odd, I never was a big fan of Dynasty Warriors. Who knew what a slap of fresh Zelda paint could do for my interest in a franchise? Am I shallow? Or did we name our LLC Take the Studios for a reason? Spoiler alert, it's the second one. Hyrule Warriors takes place outside of the timeline in a parallel Hyrule which sees Zelda in her familiar princess role with Impa as her guard, while Link is a Hyrule Knight in training. Sia is a big bad witch in town after getting stealing power from Ganondorf. It's up to the gang, with Sia's good witch sister Lana, to stop her. Eventually they chase Sia through various portals that had been opened up which lead through the worlds of the Ocarina of Time, Twilight Princess, and Skyward Sword. Various characters are picked up along the way through this fun and fan-serving story. The amount of characters this game boasts is amazing. Darunia, 
Princess Ruto, Agatha, Midna, Fee, Sheik, and you'll even get villains to play as, such as Ganondorf, Girahim, and Zant. On top of the numerous characters, this game also has a huge array of weapons, which are collected by random drops for each character, and a truly in-depth and grindy weapon and skill system, which begs for replaying levels and playing the game's adventure mode, which is actually how you unlock the use of various characters and weapon sets. Amiibos were also used as a way to unlock or get more powerful weapons. This game should have been a cheaply tacked on fan mode within a $60 price tag, but it wasn't. It is a top 5 Wii U game, and one that was equally fun in solo play or gamepad TV co-op play, and that's not even counting the DLC and 3DS expansion, plus more DLC from that game. Wow. Good job, Koi Tecmo. You got number 5. If there is one game that is a part of an existing franchise that truly stood out on Wii U, it's Mario Kart 8. Fourth on our list, but first in the heart of many. It's the only launch Windows Switch game that is blatantly just a full price re-release, and that's because it's worth every penny, twice. Can we ignore that the battle mode was terrible? No. But even more reason to be amazed at the job they did with this game to make such a glaring issue be something most people forgot about. Mario Kart 8 launched with 32 tracks, 30 characters, and over 50 different vehicle parts. This was the biggest assortment of things in the franchise to date. Not to mention that with added DLC, the totals became 48 tracks, 36 characters, and over 70 vehicle parts. The big gameplay hook this time around really allowed a remix to your standard or returning tracks with anti-gravity, which allowed driving on the walls and ceilings. It also allowed inadvertent boosts in speed whenever you wrecked into one another, which added another layer of strategy into this madhouse of a racing game franchise. Mario Kart 8, of course, supported the monstrous success that is Amiibo with custom Mii costumes unlocked by its corresponding Amiibo. A big feature this game introduced to the world was YouTube uploading of gameplay. After a race, either online or single player, you had the option to edit the highlight reel and then share it to your YouTube. This was an incredible feat for a company so reluctant to truly connect to the digital social world. To top off all the content this game has is the smooth 60 frames per second visuals complemented by a remarkable soundtrack. Number four, great. Good job, Nintendo. What happens when Nickelodeon and Nintendo have a squid baby who enlists in the military? The third game in our Wii eulogy, that's what. With squid kids battling over what color to paint the floor, Turf War was its most simple, but also most successful game modes. Three minute matches, most inked floor area wins, simple, fast, fun. Oh, and a cat referees the matches too. With a fresh style that was reinforced by its amazing soundtrack and awesome clothing, this game pulled off something truly unique and very welcome. Splatoon cracks our top three by being a game that encouraged community and evolution of gameplay. Let's talk about those two things. First off, community. Splatoon had a strong connection to Miiverse and John Cena, and it was very premeditated. Any drawing post made in the Splatoon Miiverse page automatically became graffiti somewhere in the game, either in the lobby city area of Ingopolis or on the actual map of a match. These drawings were even more on display during everyone's favorite time of the month, Splatfest. Pick one of two sides and rep your fandom one night out of the month on special nighttime maps. Also enjoy Callie and Marie breaking away from their host duties to put on a concert in the middle of Inkopolis. The Splatfest pitted Autobots versus Decepticons, Pokemon Red versus Pokemon Blue, SpongeBob versus Patrick, and even made you choose between Callie and Marie in the final Splatfest ever. Without a doubt, Splatoon truly encouraged community engagement. On the side of evolution, it goes like this. Splatoon launched with five multiplayer maps and a story mode with 32 stages. In less than a year, as free DLC, the game added 11 more multiplayer maps, ranked multiplayer mode which introduced three new game modes only accessible in ranked, constant updates providing enhanced features and tons of new weapons and gear. That's evolution for free. Except the best gear came from the amiibos. Plastic paywall. Splatoon shows its importance to Nintendo by anchoring the Switch during the upcoming summer months. Our second favorite game in the Wii U library was not a tough choice. Make Donkey Kong great again. That was basically the new motto for Retro Studios as they moved from the Metroid Prime franchise to revive the Donkey Kong Country series on Wii with Donkey Kong Country Returns. It was flawless. Well, at least if you get over the omission of King K. Rule. 
The sequel makes a point to grow from that and take DK to new heights never seen in platformers. Living, breathing worlds that are seamlessly interacted while still being a true, top-notch platformer. The enemies were a cool departure from Kremlins of the original trilogy and the Tiki's of DKC Returns, as the Kong's home was invaded by Nordic Arctic animal villains. This introduced a natural progression for the island to harsh snow territory. Another thing that helped make this world seem truly living was the cast of Kongs, including the new playable characters Dixie and Scrooge Mc... D I mean Cranky Kong. Between Diddy's jetpack, thanks to DK64, Dixie's helicopter hair, and Cranky's pogo stick, the levels were able to offer increased variety from previous entries. These characters interacting also helps the minimal storytelling grow in a wonderful way. The music helps set the epic tone of a family trying to save the life they know on the island they call home. When Donkey gets mad, you get mad. Let's not forget how hard Retro Studios worked to make this the game they wanted for DKC fans. They ignored the major push Nintendo was forcing on everyone for gamepad support and focused on just making the best game they could make. That possibly put them in the Nintendo doghouse for a brief period, but it also gave us the best platformer in the Wii U library, and possibly the best platformer of all time. That's more than enough to make Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze number 2 on our Wii U-ology top 10. And finally, we are here. The last goodbye to the Wii U from us at Take This Studios. Saving the best for last is appropriate, but also subjective. It is purely our opinion, however, we do in fact believe that Super Smash Bros. for Wii U was the greatest game in its entire library for multiple reasons. Let's count some of the ways. Detailed development, check. This game may have sent Sakurai into early retirement with the amount of features, characters, stages, and continued support this game received. The game has a total of 58 characters, 17 of which were newcomers. 55 stages, not counting the endless supply of user-created stages, and it introduced a game board mode, a more in-depth trophy collection, online spectating with betting, and online tournaments. Did we mention controller support? It seems trivial, but the esports crowd is very particular about its controllers. But this game supported the GameCube controllers through a custom adapter released just for this game. It also supported using a 3DS as a controller, Wiimotes, Pro Controllers, Retro Controllers, and all sorts of third-party controllers, but not the Donkey Kong like Konga thing. Why need all the controller support, you ask? Because of 8-player mode. Yes, 8 players fighting at the same time on massive stages. It's insane and we love it. And we can't talk about Smash Brothers without mentioning the big marketing tool it leveraged that actually wound up putting profits in Nintendo's hands for the foreseeable future, Amiibo. Yes, those little plastic, non-articulated toys made their very basic start on this game. Scan in the character and train it up and it learns from your fighting becomes better than you in every way. There's nothing you can do about it. It will destroy your soul. This started a gravy train that doesn't seem stoppable. And yes, there were over 50 of those $13 toys to collect. If anything, hopefully the Wii U is remembered for the greatest entry into the Smash Brothers franchise. Sorry, Melee fans. And also, we hope Sakurai has one more great Smash game left in it. This has been our Wii U Legend. It lived a short but impactful life. It wasn't a jack of all trades, but it was definitely a master of some. We will remember you finally, and not in the fake Sujo nostalgic Dreamcast way, because you were actually good and didn't suck. If you are bummed out, remember to check out all of our gaming tournaments, some of which feature games from this very list. The support there is charity, so it'd be great if you shared them. And go ahead and subscribe so you can keep up with the upcoming tournaments. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. <laughs>